So hello, Professor Bright here. Welcome back to the Sunless Skies, where we just had a weird bug. We didn't save the fact that I got through this Eleutheria transit relay. So I'm a little concerned about that. Also, now that we're back in the Reach, I have to decide exactly what we're going to be doing in the Reach. Which I'm not entirely sure. I mean, the first thing we're going to do is go to Magdalene's. That's not my first goal. But after that, uh, mm, I don't know. Part of me says go back to Albion, but there are a few things we can do in and around the Reach. The only reason I'd go back to Albion is just because most of my officers' storylines take place there. Alternatively, we might end up going back to the Blue Kingdom. I say back because that's apparently where we were before the game entirely started. And I kind of want to go in there, but at the same time, it would be nice to have better equipment, better gear, more money... Uh, perhaps more crew. Although, 12 crew members. <laughs> Is this really how I left off? Because, I mean, we're doing pretty damn good. Oh, God, I forgot about you. Yeah, sure do. Oh, could you not? Oh, great. Because what I was really missing was a cantankery. Um... Go for it. Hooray, an uncanny specimen. Most useful. But this should serve as a pretty good indicator for how well the Atlani is going to be doing in the future. And so far, we're doing pretty great, I would say. But extra speed is very nice. Okay, it'd be great if you stopped doing that. That'd be just the best. Could you die as well? That would be lovely. Thank you. All right. Try to render it edible? No. Um. Hmm. Let's see what we got out of this. Some terror and some sovereigns. Okay. Not entirely worth it, but not entirely not worth it either. Oh, most importantly. Hmm. Well... We'll look into that in just a moment. Mm. No, I don't have my stuff with me. That's a shame. Uh, see, if I enter it, usually that kills a lot of my people. Is the thing, so... Let's take the repairs, thank you. Oh my god, why? Okay, well, this is happening now. Oh, really? And uno mas. Okay, we are doing great with this ship. I am so happy. Um, let's see what we get. Uh, some extra fuel. Fair. Okay. Ow. Did more damage to me than the enemies did. Hmm. Is this nature? The fairy tales don't mention pustules. Uh, Prince is revolted by Hybris being, well, Hybris. Let's get ourselves a port report real quick, just to get some extra money. When we get to Winchester. Oof. Oof. A little bit of a hit there. Hmm? The crew requests a little R&R. &R. Fair, I guess. We follow you into what? Passes for a meadow between livid mushrooms and oozing polyps. The silence of the place hangs heavily on you. Some of the crew attempt to break it with a ballad of the promised days. I uh, could do. Join the crew in their song. It's part of your job to keep the morale up and tear her down. But then again, you're not far from Shasta's leg and it's promising bronzewood trees. Uh, pity. A fruitless search. You explore the leg, but even the most promising trees are infested with hybrid hybrian rock. And the others are too large to fell without specialized equipment. Shame. But let's see here. Gather a port report. And I don't think there was anything here to really do. So for now, I'm just going to leave. I'm sorry. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh-huh.
During your recent altercation, a round of enemy fire bored clean through the bridge. No one was killed, but your crew are shaken. Their minds wander, their hands tremble, they question orders, something must be done. Hmm. Speak of your own narrow escape. You've had your own encounter with death. I've had a few of them. Your terror has fallen. Good. You share your story in the galley that night while the crew gather to listen. You tell them that they are different now. Death's shadow has passed over them and they cannot be as they were before. They can choose to be more canny or they can choose to be more bold. Or you suppose they could continue to be afraid and die all the same. <laughs> Fair. That's... I'm not sure that's the most inspirational thing I've ever heard of, but it's fair. It's reasonable. I should think. Let us move on and see what else we find. Hmm, maybe it's stop at Palmer and Plenty's. Also, why do I suddenly have all the... Oh, I can see the... Cuddles comb? I don't remember that at all. I'm curious about that. I've seen the wreck of the Parzival. I vaguely remember that. Actually, I pretty... Yeah, pretty... Clearly remember it. Ugh, that was unpleasant. Necessary what we did. Bringing the captain over to... I believe it was the Trader's Wood, if I remember correctly. But, uh, yeah. Hmm, speaking of, we could probably finish off that storyline, couldn't we? We'll just make some good progress towards it. I don't know. There are choices to be made, many choices. But first things first. Gotta get back to New Winchester. I think we have something to drop off or someone to pick up. Can't quite remember. And then we can worry about everything else afterwards. Oh, and Lustrum has that location with all the... Oh, right. Yeah, because I have a claim there that probably has been being worked for a while now. Really? Really, you want to you take this on? You really don't, buddy. I'll tell you that right now, you don't. Hey, buddy. How's it going? Took more damage from just shooting my cannons than from you. Which, side note, if there was an item I could attach that would prevent that, that would be great. I hope there is. I hope that's actually an attachment you can get for your locomotive. Because that... I like those things that change mechanics rather than just being a straightforward upgrade. That's pretty easy, you know. Here's this object that prevents... Eh, your engines from exploding. You know, it's pretty easy design, I guess. Well, I imagine it is, anyway. I feel like it wouldn't be too hard to script, but then again, I don't know the code used to build this, so I could be very wrong. Uh, once I have all my stuff equipped, you... well, hmm. Well, most of this will be mine. Hmm. Let's see here. Actually, how... hmm. Yeah, I think we would leave the additional cargo bay. We'd mostly leave things just as they are. Wouldn't we? Hmm. Harumph. Either way, though, Palmer and Plenties. I think I already have a job from you guys, but maybe I don't. I could be wrong. <laughs> the Oompa Oompa of distant circus music. Oh, no, no. Sorry, I wasn't paying attention. was reading. Was making mistakes. Paying attention to letters in the sky instead of to rocks in the sky. Unfortunate decision, that. Alright, new arrivals. Perhaps... Hmm. Listen to their stories. Who were they before they were called here? The broken, disavowed fugitives. Every visitor has their own story and a hole in their heart. A few demonstrate acts with which they hope to join the circus itself. I was talking of their plans to leave this place and resume their lives. Not today, but tomorrow. Always tomorrow. Write ourselves a port report. Thank you. Deliver a Christmas card. The card is addressed to Yisia Darwar Kaimarag. He is the cleaner at Palmyre and Plenty's. You find the man by the animal cages, sweeping. 
He tears the envelope open and reads furiously at some moments before he can bring himself to speak. I spoke Welsh only to my family. There was no harm. He shakes his head. But someone tattled and the auditors had to check, didn't they? The auditors even agreed there was no harm. Not that anyone believed me. The auditors wouldn't visit unless you were in trouble, right? He grimaces. I couldn't stay in London, could I? I had to leave my family. I couldn't risk tainting them. He waves the card to you. I'll join your council. I'll meet the contact now. Oh. Hmm. Interessante. Oh, have I not been able to do this yet? Okay. Purchase tickets to the circus. Hmm. Visit the amusements. Yes, now speak to the ringmaster. <laughs> oh dear. Oh, thank God, we've got a show to put on. One of my biggest acts is throwing a tantrum. I, no, no. He pauses, toying with his exquisitely managed mustache as he looks up you up and down. I don't suppose you've ever considered stepping into the ring yourself. No, no, I have not. I offer your services as a lion tamer. You have nothing to fear from some flea-bitten beast. This seems like a bad choice. Perhaps not. Whip in hand, you stare down the circus's one remaining lion. It makes it clear that it, when it comes to meat, there is meat that it respects, and meat that it does not. Afterwards, the ringmaster claps you on the shoulder. Excellent. Well, terrible. Never do that again. But please, come and see me behind the tents. Okay. Okay. Go behind the tents. You're welcome everywhere here. The car needs nod to you as you pass. Beyond the performers and the permanent audience, the circus is deserted. Everyone keeps to their quarters, unless they're practicing the show. Despite the Calliope music, the mood back here is closer to that of a mausoleum. Visit the ringmaster's caravan. The door's open. From inside, you can hear the constant ruffling of a deck of cards. Hats, cats, bats, and rats. The ringmaster sat on a fat cushion, idly shuffling a warm pack of playing cards. He smiles warily at you. Ask the cards about you. He draws from the top of the deck, sets them on the table. They say you can help. He then places them back into the deck and bids you shuffle and draw for yourself. The cards are the same. He smiles the same weary smile, and looks like they haven't changed their minds. Hmm. Accept a commission to post flyers for the strongwoman. Six of rats. Ideally, the strongwoman's act is to lift unusual objects brought in by the crowd. The problem is no one knows they're supposed to bring something. The ringmaster leans under his desk to pick up a fat bundle of posters. He drops them with a thud. We need these slapped all across Port Prospers and Magdalene's. Easily done. I think I can only take on one at a time, if I remember correctly. Hmm. Hmm. We've read these before, so I don't think I'm going to re-familiarize myself with them yet. Although, she is the one we're helping. If she's performing a training, she tends to keep inside her caravan. She welcomes you to her caravan and begs you pardon for the mess. For though the caravan is a remarkable oasis of cleanliness in the otherwise untidy port, the only other seat she can offer is stacked with poems. He places them beneath her own chair, and begins to ask you questions about your life. Any inquiries into her own, she deflects with the wit of a slighted baroness. Hmm. Interessant. wonder if she is a baroness. Either way, we're going to be going... Uh, you know what? New Winchester, Port Prosper, Magdalene's. I think that's the best route right now, because... Might as well do as many things at once as we can. You. You are a tackety scout. I actually read in my journal that you guys apparently developed a new ship that I still haven't found. Hmm. Someday, just not today, I suppose. Not sure what I'll do if I find it, though. Ooh, lag of loading. Okay. That's gotta be something in the design of the game that's causing that. Like, I don't know exactly what, but... Huh. Because I'm not the only one who's experienced this. Like, at least one other person in the comments has, and I assume it's a common thing. I suppose it could be tied to the fact that I'm recording, but, well, yeah, whatever. I'll not inquire into the mysteries of the lag of loading just yet. I probably should. It would be better if I had, and found a way to fix it. Oh, God, why is it so much worse just in Right now. Okay. Alright. 
Perhaps I should. Hmm. I love this engine so much. I just love the design of it with the two wings. Uh, the small things, you know? Plus the actual, like, wood, colored wood. This red wood kind of look. I don't know what exactly it is, but... Uh, oh? Things have changed in New Winchester. The Windward Company has made recent gains against the Tacketys, enough to reestablish their presence in the town. They've reoccupied Company House, giving it a fresh coat of paint, and hoisted a defiant London flag. The pubs near the station are abuzz with the news. The Colonial Assembly are even now locked in accusatory debate in Victory Hall. There's little they can do, though. London has sent fresh dreadnoughts to reinforce the company's claim, and the balance of power in the Reach has returned to its traditional state of simmering stalemate. Interesting. The Ride of the Liberties. The Tackety pubs buzz with excitement. The development of the new Liberator class of locomotive is complete. The new engines have already been sighted in the skies, often in the company of smaller Tackety scouts with use for them which use them for refuel and resupply. Learn what you can about the Tackety's new weapon in the Winchester War. Rumors are fired. You gather they are sluggish and heavy and much more resilient than their smaller cousins, the Scouts. A blistered engineer claims to have seen one in action engaging marauders in the path of Trader's Wood. Don't get round the sides of them, is all you will say, unless you like being boiled like a sardine in a can. Interesting. Hmm. Well, either way, fully repair the hull, and I love that I can do that again. Ah, oh, makes everything so much simpler. Uh, oh. Oh, yes! Attend the grand premiere. Madame Lumiere has wasted no time in organizing her premiere. To express her gratitude, she's given you tickets. Madame Lumiere has reopened a theater beneath the arches of Bishopbridge. Prominent tacticians sit with London sympathizers. They formed a brief truce, united in their loathing of the cramped velvet seats. A light flares on the plaster wall. The film begins. The film is titled The Concupiscence of the Verdants. Flickering images on painted lenses jerk across the wall. The camera luxuriates in the collapsing brown flesh of a fruiting fungus. The flight of a sporing body, the sudden bursting of a violet fungal sac. The prolonged death spasms of a cameraman. There are gasps from the audience, I would imagine. Taking the detail, Lumiere has an exacting eye. Some of the shots are blemished, but what has been captured reveals much about the Reach's floor. This work is worth careful attention. Hmm. The final sequence of the rotting fungal husks collapsing onto the settlement is exquisite, and yet you are the only one who remains behind to congratulate Lumiere. I wish more were so discerning, she smiles. Still, this will only start. Please, meet me later. You attend the premiere. God help you. M Madame Lumiere would like another meeting. I'll take those uncanny specimens, though. Meet her again. Madame Lumiere's were promised a meeting. She's currently occupying one of New Winchester's cafes. She provided the table number. She rings for two cups of nectar-infused tea. I crave the stuff, she says, a smile creasing her face like a well-used cushion. I'm too old to be lugging cameras about anymore, waiting for the perfect shot. My own fault, I could have stayed in London, but I wanted to see the stars. And thanks for helping me home. This is where I'll stay now, I think. She coughs into a yellow-stained handkerchief. Time to fund films rather than make them, I think. The coughing worsens. Please excuse me. She leaves you with a hurried goodbye and the bill. Hmm. Curious. Drop off a passenger for the New Street Line. The contact will meet you in Kissagar Gardens. Hmm. The gardens are planted with somber species imported from Old Earth and grown under the golden light of the clockwork sun. The veins of the leaves are delicate as cut glass. The philanthropist has alerted the local conductor to your arrival. He meets you beside a grey statue of a serene mermaid. His voice is plummy and moneyed. My handsome will take us from here. Thank you, friend. One work world are saved. Hmm. Oh? <gasps> oh. Recent news. A down locomotive on Hybris. A tacky engine's gone down in the fungal jungle of Hybris, being a remote and mysterious colony on the very edge of the reach. Ooh. The town crier pauses for breaths and enter breath and enters an alarming coughing fish fit having inhaled a lung full of smog. An enterprising stovepipe claps him sharply on the back. Thanks, you sputters. Are there any brave captains willing to rescue these poor souls from perfidy and mushrooms and such like? I mean I'm really not, but sure. Step up to the call. The rescue of a tackety engine offers opportunities and not necessarily just for the tackities. Hmm, cometh the hour. Cheers go up among the crowd as you step forward. God bless you, Captain, the crier says. His eyes are washed with tears, though that could just be the smog. 
New Winchester needs more of such sog. Where are now the heroes of the blockade? He hands you the report, which reveals the engine was last seen heading to Hybris. He runs on, calling for a state of perpetual revolution, to a mixed response from the crowd. Hmm. Hope that's not timed. I assume it isn't. But now I think... Oh. Wait, yes, I could do this. Excellent. The Song of the Sky looms in your mind, an unfinished monument. You've amassed a collection of tales that linger after the telling. First step made. The first canto. You sit at your desk. The blank page yawns before you like an abyss. Memories crawl from the depths of the spiteful howl of the sky winds, the honey roar of a well-kept engine, the darkness of the stars. Yes. Excellent. Oh. Before you can truly begin the Song of the Sky, you must make a decision. Are you writing about a fictional character, merely drawing inspiration from your own experiences, or are you writing an explicit memoir? Um, a memoir. You wouldn't intend to be famous, after all. Why hide your light under a bushel? Perfection. You don't see the need to attach a different name and face to the story. Even the thinnest veneer of falsehood could detract from the whole. It's the Song of the Sky, and you will sing it in your own voice. Now to find a publisher. Oh. At first, each word must be individually wrestled from your recalcitrant mind, and somewhere between brain and paper, they lose their luster. Finally, just as the mountain of crumpled paper beside your desk has reached your knees, you strike something, a match, a vein, a melancholy chord. You write until you need to sleep, then you sleep until you need to write. When you resurface, the first canto is complete, but what now? You're not nearly finished the song, not yet, but perhaps you've written enough to show to a publisher. We'll have to find one. You've written only a fraction, but if you're lucky, it'll be enough to secure a book deal. Ooh. Oh. Rejection. The reputable publishing houses of New Winchester are crammed into small corn street, where the roaring presses give the impression of a nearby sea. Your first pitch begins swimmingly. Remarkable, murmurs the editor. Effortlessly lyrical, mythological in ambition. When he asks after a deal, however, he shakes his head. No, no, it won't make a penny. You work your way down the street, your increasingly bedraggled manuscript clutched closely to your chest. Finally, you catch an editrix just as she leaves for the day. I won't publish this, she says, flipping through the pages, but I know someone who might. She jots an address on the back of your manuscript. Okay. It's a crooked house in an unsavory part of town. As you open the door, you are buffeted by cigarette fumes. A man appears amid the smoke, his hand slithering into yours. The other one has been terrorizing Smoghorn Street, hmm? Says the omnivorous publisher, his grin encompassing his face. Let me see. He snatches the manuscript. Excellent, he says, breathing twin plumes of appreciative smoke as he reads. I'd like to offer you a deal. Oh? Negotiate a contract. The publisher sits at his desk. You almost lose sight of him behind the swamp of paperwork, books thick with bookmarks and overflowing ashtrays. 100% chance of success, though. Ooh. Oh, that's not as much as I thought it would be. Um, fair and fair. After long hours of negotiation, during which you inhale enough secondhand cigarette smoke to poison a cat, you work out a suitable advance. The omnivorous publisher agrees to publish your work serially, canto by canto. He hauls a tarpaulin aside with a flourish to reveal a slumbering behemoth of a printing press. Tomorrow the song will be the talk of the town, he assures you. His prophecy does not come true. The first canto is a brief sensation, the subject of a few days' dinner party conversation among literary circles, but it soon sinks into obscurity as the next curiosity comes along. Perhaps the publisher might help you make a success of the second. Hmm. I need a, mon a momentous exploit, not a monumentous one. The first canto was a quiet success, quickly forgotten. That's not good enough. The publisher's office, which you suspect is also his house, is even more dilapidated than when you first visited. The doorknob comes off in your hand. If you want to make the second canto an extraordinary success, write about something extraordinary, says the publisher, jabbing a cigarette into his desk for emphasis. Something that no one will be able to ignore. I mean, I've already... Oh. Well, that'll do. Need to save the sun. You are the knight of clocks. Ooh, actually, I kind of like that. You are the saint of wells. You have explored the boatman. You're a successful member of parliament. Hmm. And you've managed to convey a bill to the very throne of ours. That's amazing. Hmm. <gasps> oh. Interesting. This seems a bit more my style, but uh, not right now. We've discovered the uh, fate of the Parzival. The publisher leans back amid a halo of smoke. Imagine I'm the average man on the street. By which you mean a philistine of the lowest order. What have you done lately to capture my attention? 
publish is silent for a long time once you've finished telling your tale. He blinks a few times. Even his cigarette is extinguished. Stunning, he says finally. Make sure you write it exactly like that. And so we write. You've accomplished something so remarkable, so singular, it can't be perfectly translated into words. But you'll try. And apparently level up, too. You sit at your desk. You stand, you pace, you sit again. You stare from the window. Where to begin? You remember the look in the publisher's vaguely reptilian eyes when you first told him this story. A mix of disbelief, awe, and half-concealed greed. You've been a kinder audience than the blank page. You begin to type, remembering how you worded your story in the first telling. Soon the typewriter is clacking and ringing merrily. The story stirs in your mind like some disturbed undersea monster, unspooling its tendrils before rushing leviathan-like to the surface. Hmm. Oh. A pause in your fever typing. Before you write any further, you must make a decision. There are many ways to tell a tale. Are you writing dry journalism with a hint of dark humor? A page turner with bounding, scintillating prose? Or yearning verse tinged with melancholy? I'm kind of into prose myself. Words that bite even as they entice the reader to chase after the next. Your aim is simple, to devour the reader whole and to only regurgitate them when you are sure you are done with them. Hmm. Words spit like lightning from your fingertips. The typewriter shudders and clanks in protest under the strain. You write in a kind of fury, your mind's eye raging with images of gloating stars and endless burning emptiness. And then you sit back, exhausted as you realize you've run out of words. The second canto is complete. When you take the second canto to the omnivorous publisher, he flashes a goblin-like grin. We have set the city on fire, he declares with convincing menace. The printing press wheezes into life. Paper turns as we publish the second conto. The next day, copies of the first and second contos are being ruthlessly hawked by bookstalls and enterprising penny vendors across the city. Extraordinary tale of a local sky captain who discovered the lost pars of all, declares one salesman, waving copies of your pamphlet in the air like a holy text. A voyage beyond imagining, shouts another one with relish. Those who read the Song of the Sky shall not leave unscathed. The second canto is quickly the subject of fevered gossip and speculation. Could it all be true? Newspapers deign to review it and throw around words like astonishing to describe both your exploits and your prose. Hmm. The Song of the Sky looms in your mind, an unfinished monument, and perhaps not. We might be able to finish this all tonight. Which, uh, well, I don't know. Part of me wants that, part of me doesn't. I hope I don't have to retire immediately after I finish this, but now... We're going to write the third canto of the Song of the Sky. The second canto caught the public's eye. The third must somehow live up to its predecessor. No contemplation, no procrastination, no hours of prolonged hesitation. Not this time. Your story catches you like a fever and your fingers whirl so fast you threaten to tangle your typewriter's keys. Hmm. A pause in your fever typing. Before you write any further, you must make a decision. Are you depicting your actions as purely heroic or are you going to be honest? Honest, you'll not finish flinch from bearing your own flaws and foibles and occasional felonies. Always honest, never heroic. It's not just honesty that compels you to tell the truth, this will make for a better story. A captain of many shades, a mirror reflecting both light and dark. Hopefully it won't cause too many legal problems. You stare at the half empty page in panic. For a moment you fear you've lost your terrible momentum, but then the story catches you in its arms again, and you are a golem, a conduit, a ghost desperate to relay its final message. You write until your fingers are blistered, until the ending catches you by surprise. You recline, sweat-drenched. The third canto is complete. When you take the third canto to the omnivorous publisher, he scans it with an empty grin before handing it to one of his assistants. Assistants. How long has he had assistants? Another masterpiece, he says. You never cease to amaze. The omnivorous publisher's assi assistants flit around the printing press like tiny fish around the jaws of a shark. He sits back and pours himself a whiskey. Hmm. The excited speculation around the second conto had only just begun to die down, and now vendors are selling the third conto find themselves mobbed by small, eager crowds whose zeal has been reawakened. Over the next few days, you spot citizens of all stripes reading your pamphlet, from a vagrant under a bridge to a monocled aristocrat. A journalist interviews you, and any suspicion of his hostility evaporates when he starts slim stammering his admiration of your work. All the newspapers he prays for weeks, you're the toast of New Winchester's coffee shops and bookstores and other bastions of culture. Hmm... I need another mon momentous exploit. Yes, there we go. There's the word. Speak one more time. You suspect you've accomplished something suitably extraordinary. I just want to check. I see. Although I could. These are not difficult things to do. I think I'm going to aim to become the Knight of Clocks, though, because I just love that idea. 
The night of clockwork. Hmm. Sounds delightful. But enough about that for now. Right now, I think it is time to re-equip our engine a bit more appropriately. Just a touch more appropriately, I should say. Uh, and then we will call it a night. We have one of these. We have one of these. Yes. Yes. One of those. One of these, and one of these can go away. And get rid of that, too. Alright. Next episode, we will be getting ourselves fully equipped and ready to go. Mm, probably Magdalene's Port Prosper and then Hybris will be our next route. And then Palmer and and then back to New Winchester to refuel. I think that sounds like a good plan, but that'll be a matter for next episode. For now, thank you for your time. Note the like, comment, and subscribe buttons below. Use them responsibly, and I will see you all soon. Bye! Goodbye.